back to the Fourth Way Podcast. In this episode, I had the opportunity to interview Abby Kleckner, who is a frequent on the Bad Roman Podcast. I reached out to her because I had read some of her articles, which dealt with a topic that I had recently revisited while reading a little bit of Tolstoy. I forget if it was Tolstoy's, um, like, my religion or uh, what I believe, one of those those books. Um, but Tolstoy talked, uh, he has this section where he talks about the diffusion of responsibility, which is is something that I'll, I'll uh, explain a little bit and we'll talk about as we get into the show. But I want to read you this excerpt from Tolstoy because I think it's, it's going to be something that um, he says so well in, in a relatively short space and something that is, I hope you're able to chew on as you listen to this episode. So here is an extended section from Tolstoy. Quote, But the moment we detach ourselves from the idea that the existing organization established by man is the best, is sacred, the moment we do this, the objection that the doctrine of Jesus is contrary to human nature turns immediately upon him who makes it. No one will deny that not only to kill or torture a man, but to torture a dog, to kill a fowl or a calf, is to inflict suffering reproved by human nature. I have known of farmers who had ceased to eat meat solely because it had fallen to their lot to slaughter the animals. And yet, our existence is so organized that, far, uh, that every personal enjoyment is purchased at the price of human suffering contrary to human nature. We have only to examine closely the complicated mechanism of our institutions that are based upon coercion to realize that coercion and violence are contrary to human nature. The judge who is condemned according to the code is not willing to hang the criminal with his own hands. No clerk would tear a villager from his weeping family and cast him into prison. The general or the soldier, unless he be hardened by discipline and service, will not undertake to slay a hundred Turks or Germans or destroy a village would not, if he could help it, kill a single man. Yet all these things are done thanks to the administrative machinery, which divides responsibility for misdeeds in such a way that no one feels them to be contrary to nature. Some make the laws, others execute them. Some train men to dis by discipline to automatic obedience, and these last, in their turn, become the instruments of coercion and slay their kind without knowing why or to what end. But let a man disentangle himself for a moment from this complicated network, and he will readily see that coercion is contrary to nature. Let us abstain from affirming that organized violence of which we make use to our own profit is a divine, immutable law, and we shall see clearly which is most in harmony with human nature, the doctrine of violence or the doctrine of Jesus. What is the law of nature? Is it to know that my security and that of my family all my amusements and pleasures are purchased at the expense of misery, deprivation, and suffering of thousands of human beings by the terror of the gallows, by the misfortune of thousands of stifling with imprisoned walls, by the fear inspired by millions of soldiers and guardians of civilization, torn from their homes and besotted by discipline, to protect our pleasures with loaded revolvers against the possible interference of the famishing? Is it to purchase every fragment of bread that I put in my mouth in the mouths of my children by the numberless privations that are necessary to procure my abundance? Or is it to be certain that my piece of bread only belongs to me when I know that everyone else has a share and that no one starves while I eat? It is only necessary to understand that, thanks to our social organization, each one of our pleasures, every minute of our cherished tranquility, is obtained by the sufferings and privations of thousands of our fellows. It is only necessary to understand this, to know what is comfortable to human nature, not to our animal natures alone, but the animal and spiritual nature of which constitutes man. When we once understand the doctrine of Jesus in all its bearings, with all its consequences, we shall be convinced that his doctrine is not contrary to human nature, but that its sole object is to supplant the chimerical law of the struggle against evil by violence, itself the law, contrary to human nature and productive of so many evils. End quote. Tolstoy is a, is a very powerful writer, and, and here at the end when he talks about, uh, you know, in, in all its bearings, um, that 
I don't know if that, that was purposeful, but it sounds a lot like uh, Aiden Balu's work, um, Nonviolence and All Its Important Bearings, something like that, uh, which I'm going to do in the in the next season. I already have it. Uh, I've started recording it. So I definitely recommend that. I'll, I'll put a link in the show notes. I'll also put Tolstoy's quote in the show notes so you can read it and chew on it. But Tolstoy hits at something, you know, that um, our conscience, we know that violence and coercion and, and all of this stuff and, and letting people, um, while I eat my bread, uh, that was procured at least through some injustices and while other people are famishing and I have surplus, um, like we're, we're, we're complicit in this coercion, in, in this violence, um, in our everyday lives through the actions that we do. But because that pow- that responsibility and and our power is kind of diffused in various ways we don't really feel guilty about it and we don't really do anything about it and we don't really critique the system and so that's going to be kind of the basis of of uh what I talk with with uh, Abby Kleckner on today in this episode and um I think we we draw out some some pretty good things to chew on and and I'm going to have a ton of um a ton of links in the show notes for resources to recommend. So this is one of those that I think you're going to want to listen to over and over and and follow up on the resources because there's a lot to chew on here. So without further ado, let us get into the interview. Hard part for me about anarchism seems to be that that the state seems really good, right? Roads are the things that that a lot of times people <laughs> yeah. bring up for for whatever reason. Um, but living in Romania, you know, healthcare for them is is something that they would view as a good because everybody is able to to get healthcare. Um, mm-hmm. And so, I, I want to kind of take a look behind the curtain this week. And uh, what kind of started me thinking about this was um, I read one of your or a couple of your articles uh, through the Bad Roman, where you were making. Um, this this connection between something I'd read in Tolstoy and, and elsewhere, but never really thought about doing an episode on it. You made this connection about um, the diffusion of power. So you talked about voting and you talked about a um, bunch of different ways that the government um, diffuses power. So I want to I want to really talk about that a lot today, and I want to ask you questions about some of your articles, and I'll I'll put those articles in the show notes so that people can can get to those too. But I think probably here you'll be able to expound on those maybe a, a little bit more than in the short space that you give an article to as well. Um, so I, I want to just kind of quickly define like what what the three ways that I think you're able to bring out what a diffusion of power is. And then I'll shut up and try to just ask you <laughs> questions and let you do most of the talking since, uh, since you're the expert here. Um, so as far as I was able to see it, it seemed like there there's a diffusion of power in three different ways that uh, that I think you were able to to kind of point to. And so the first the first type of diffusion of power is where like you've you've got the centralized power um, and it, it breaks up into lots of little pieces. So for example, the power to kill, right? It's not just one person's power. You know, Joe Biden right now doesn't get to just kill people. But there's a cop who arrests somebody. There's a judge who, um, you know, d- helps to determine the guilt. You've got jurors. You've got um, prison wardens and guards, and the person who actually flips the switch. Like you just diffuse this power to kill to a lot of different people, almost like the firing squad. You know, where they give like yeah. one person a blank bullet, so nobody knows. You kind of diffuse that responsibility. So that's one way that that we're going to talk about it. But then the, uh, the second way that I think you identify, which is probably a bit more contentious and, and maybe harder to grasp, is you sort of talk about, especially with voting, you talk about how power is, is almost diffused like from a large area. So I guess it would be concentrated to, to a smaller area. So for example, yeah, voting, where I have my little slice of power and I give it to the state to do something with. And then I kind of release myself from those obligations. And then the third way that you identify, which I think is is really good, um, is when you talk about how like power diffuses through our beings. So like when we grasp power, 
it it almost like contaminates us. It it turns us into, or maybe it doesn't turn us into evil creatures. Maybe it reveals the evil that's there as it diffuses through us. Um, yeah. However, you'd want to look at it. So that's that's really what I want to talk about today, and I, I want you to talk about it. So I want you first to talk about the uh, the idea of power diffusing from the top down. It's like, how does the government allow us to or cause us to do evil things that we wouldn't otherwise do as individuals, probably? And like, what does that look like in the world? Can you give some real examples of that? Yeah, so um, in that context, it I think um, you can think of it as following orders. Uh, which you hear a lot of people give criticisms of politicians or laws, um, but you don't hear as much criticism for the people who are actually carrying out the acts. Um, or you may even hear almost like hero worship for like cops and soldiers. Um, and, and when heinous acts are committed, they get the excuse of, well, they were just doing their job. Um, as if being commanded by a politician to do something absolves you of all responsibility for your actions. Uh, and I wrote a little bit about this. Um, this was the famous defense in the Nuremberg trials that they were all just following orders so they couldn't be held responsible for the war crimes, um, which in that case was <clears throat> ruled that no, that wasn't a, a good enough excuse. Um, but I think we really need to take that into account in every decision that you do. If, if you're ever absolving yourself of responsibility for your actions just because you were told to do it e either um, for your employment or, or by someone in authority, um, we still always need to take a look at our own actions and judge for ourselves if, if they're moral or not. Um, and like kids in cages at the border is a good example. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of people that, that go into making that happen and we could put the blame on Trump or we could put the blame on Biden or the dozens of politicians that came before them who enacted laws, um, immigration laws. But ultimately, it comes down to people who are willing to go after those specific people, people who are there face to face with these children that they're locking up and taking away from their parents, um, people who they're actually mistreating, um, rather than them looking at themselves and saying, I, you know, if this was my, if I saw this person as my neighbor, if I wasn't able to dehumanize them, I would never do this in a million years. But because the orders have come down from my superiors, I have to dehumanize these people and treat them in horrible ways and do things that are completely immoral. Um, but I, I don't take the guilt upon myself because I'm just following orders and I'm just doing my job. Um, so yeah, I guess that that's... <laughs> That's what I would say about that instance. And I, and I think it's important for everyone to examine, you know, even if you have a quote unquote normal job um, where you're not doing things like that, uh, you know, every decision that you're asked to make in your day to day life um, by anybody, you, you need to practice putting it through that moral filter of how do I feel about this? Even like is it the most efficient way to go about it? Or, you know, if, if you just have that double check on, on all of your actions um, that someone else is asking you to do, it will be easier if you get into a situation um, where it's a little bit harder decision or maybe bigger consequences because you've been in the habit of always doing that double check and taking the responsibility on yourself. Yeah, I was actually just talking to somebody about that um, yesterday. So I, like being a missionary, I, I, we have to raise support. And this, this other person that I was talking to works for a, uh, a, a big Christian ministry and he works, you know, by support too. And so we were talking, he was talking about, um, you know, how he was with a donor who's like a half a million a year dollar donor. And he's kind of spouting off like all of these just 
racist, not so good things. And he's like, you know, I, I hate that I did this and I, I wouldn't do it again, but I basically kept my mouth shut because, you know, the organization yeah. doesn't want me to confront him. And, and so you can kind of make all these excuses like, well, to do the Lord's work, we need this money to come in so that we can go do good things. And, um, right. and so you kind of justify the actions that you do with, with this organization over you and even using God to justify that, right? I need that money to do God's work. Totally. That's a great example. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I where again, it's, it's not coming from the state. It, it's not really even orders you're following, but you're willing to compromise your principles because you don't want to face consequences. So yeah, and small yeah. consequences. So, uh-huh. so that, yeah, that would just grow with bigger ones. Would you, I think in your article, you talk about the Milgram experiment and I'm sure some people are familiar with that, but um, I think that fits really well in here right now. Would you explain that and kind of how that ties in? Yeah, so um, it was an experiment done in the early 60s, I believe. Um, the The guy who, who ran it did it because of the Nuremberg trials. Um, and he, he wanted to test how willing people are to hurt others because an authority figure tells them so. Um, and what he found, so how the experiment worked was the 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 people involved knew they were part of an experiment. They signed up to participate. Um, so they come into a room and there's like a scientist guy in a lab coat running the experiment. Um, and they're told that they're testing, um, how, I think how punishment uh, influenced someone learning new information. Uh, so they're, they can't see the person, but there is a person on the other side of the wall that they have to ask them questions. And if they get it wrong, they have to push a button that is giving them an electric shock. Um, And now what they didn't know was that the person on the other side of the wall was just an actor and wasn't actually receiving an electric shock. Um, But the the person pushing the button believed they were giving real electric shocks to a stranger anytime they got an answer wrong. Um, And that would be including not giving an answer. So if they didn't answer the question, they also got a shock. Um, And then, so as the experiment went on, the level of the shock they believed they were giving had to be turned up higher and higher. Um, So as it went on, uh, the the person on the other side of the wall would start um, yelling out in pain and banging on the wall and saying, I don't wanna do this anymore. and they would keep increasing the shock until at the end, the person on the other side of the wall just stopped responding. So um, basically the, they believed they were increasing the shock on this person until they were either unconscious or potentially dead. And certainly were saying that they weren't consenting to the, cons- the experiment anymore. Um, and what the experiment found was that I think 100% of the people at some time stopped and questioned the experiment and said, hey, this guy doesn't want to do this anymore. I'm feeling uncomfortable. Um, And the the person in the lab coat had to encourage them to keep going. No, it's really important to the experiment that you keep going until the end. Um, So every person protested and then got the the kind of, no, it's really important. You need to keep going. And the surprising finding was that 65% of people continued to the end when they were giving electric shocks to a person who was no longer responsive. Um, So I I think that's way higher than anyone expected, but, but it just shows us that the majority of people are basically willing to kill someone just because an authority figure told them so. Yeah, and over, um, over something stupid, not even like a matter of life and death in the army, like just not answering a question for an experiment. Right, exactly. Just because they believed the experiment was important and they would mess it up if they stopped. Um, so yeah, I think that was such an important experiment. I, I don't think they could get away with doing it now. There's like more ethics codes and stuff like that where they can't do things like that anymore um but it really shows just like how strong the hold the authority has on us and um 
whether it be naturally ingrained in us or us raised to believe in authority, I'm, I'm sure that makes a big difference. Um, but I think it's, it's important to just assume that authority has some kind of power over you uh, so you can be aware of it. Um, because the, the, yeah, like I said, these people were basically willing to kill a stranger for no good reason, just because an authority figure told them to keep going. Yeah. And I, I'd, I'd, uh, recommend two books. I, I don't know if you've read these, um, but definitely for, for other people I'd recommend. Um, one of the books my wife read for her apologetics degree was, um, called ordinary men. And it was, you know, my thought was, oh, so many Jews were killed in the gas chambers. And, and it's true, they were. But um, Ordinary Men is basically about how a lot of the executions, especially outside of Germany, of, of Jews and, and Roma and, and other groups of people, were done by, um, by German units. So, like, they, they, you know, have them dig ditches and, and shoot them in the back of the head. Well, these German units, like the SS and the, the like, hardcore German nazi like lovers they're on they're at the important places you know they're they're on the front lines with russia or with europe these other guys who are going through poland and things i mean they're they're basically like your national guard like hey you're a lawyer we need to call you up hey you're a doctor we need to call you up and it's just about how so many jews were executed by ordinary men and um that's something that was kind of shocking to me when i when i first read it that Like I thought you were talking about like SS, um, you know, crazy people that are doing this stuff, but it's, it's ordinary people. Right. And that's so important to, to really understand because it's so easy to assume like, oh yeah, I'd be the one, you know, shooting Hitler or, or I'd be the one hiding people in my attic. And it's like, chances are you wouldn't. And, and you really have to come to terms with that, um, that it, it's not as easy of a decision that you think it would be. And yeah, that these were n- totally normal people who got swept up in an ideology and were willing to carry it out that far. And kind of any of us are capable of that under the right circumstances. So again, it comes down to practicing that double check of your own morality in every situation so when it comes to things like that, you don't get easily swept up and um, and understanding what your what your values are too, um, valuing humanity and uh, you know uh, above any ideology, I think is really important. I think people don't don't realize how much they value ideology over humanity. Um, like when it comes to the state. Um, you know, every law is backed by violence, but you hear people all the time everywhere talking about how many things should be illegal. And we have so many laws in this country that nobody even knows how many there are. Um, And people are perfectly fine with that violence being threatened or carried out for quote unquote, the greater good, um, if they believe it's some kind of benefit. Where I think if you really examine that, I guess if, if you put it in black and white terms, you know, violence is not worth um, any of that. If, if uh, say you're, you're concerned people might get sick from drinking raw milk, well, is violence against people selling raw milk really worth it? If you really think that out and carry it out to its logical conclusion. Um, so yeah, I think it's just really important to think through these ideas because people don't don't realize how how they really do those things in little ways in their everyday life. Yeah, we don't want you to j- die from drinking raw milk, so we'll kill you to make sure you don't. Right, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah and, and I think 2016 was kind of the wake-up call for me because I, I was a consequentialist and justified the means. I didn't know it. I would have said that I, I didn't, but you know, when it came time to vote for Trump, which is what everybody I knew that's a Christian was doing. It's kind of like, this isn't like, I, I can't do it. And um, so that was the first time in my life that I felt like I, I really checked myself on that because I had to morally compromise if I was going to vote for him. Um, and yeah, I think like you said, we have to do this daily. And I think that that's what's really important. As Christians, a lot of times I think 
our group here, we're cultural Christians and we've kind of gotten rid of practices, like practicing actual Christianity. And so like when I think, am I going to tell the truth to a supporter who who might mm -hmm. give me money? It's such a small thing, but yeah, you're right. If if I'm not willing to tell the truth to somebody who might pull a hundred dollars a month for me, do I, would I hide people in my attic at the risk of my life and my family's life? No. Right. Right. It's like the the parable that Jesus told about the widow, um, that if you can be trusted with little, you'll be given more. But if you if you can't be trusted with what you have, why should you be given more? And and you have to be trusted with the small responsibilities to be capable of taking on the big responsibilities. Okay, so um, we might have kind of already covered this, but maybe you could summarize or make it more explicit. Um, talking about this dif diffusion of, of responsibility, uh, like killing is, is the one that we've kind of been on. Could you explain specifically in regard to government, how governments do this, like through their supporting arms, like police, military, judges, um, you know, whatever you can think of. And how do they actually, how do we see evil diffused by governments in that way where, where people just, um, I don't know, uh, don't take responsibility for, for these, these actions. Right. So I think it's almost the reverse of the other point. The other point was, well, somebody higher up has commanded me to do something, so I'm just going to blindly follow orders. Um, and this is more like I want something to be carried out, but if but I'm not willing to do it myself. So if I vote for it to be done, if I elect people who will do it for me, then I don't have to not only not take the responsibility, but kind of c connect the consequences for these decisions. Like we talked about the raw milk, like, well, um, or, or any opinion. I, I don't want people to do drugs. So, so I'm willing to there to be laws, people to go to jail, people's families to be destroyed, um, people to be locked in cages because I think drugs are bad. And uh, it, it could yeah, drugs do terrible things. Um, but because you're kind of voting for things that, that separate you from um, realizing the logical progression of the, of the idea you believe in. Um, so um, you, you don't have to think of this, this is someone's life being destroyed because you're not physically doing it. You're you're dispensing that responsibility to a number of people, like you said, police, judges, um, prison guards, and all of that kind of stuff. Um, you you don't have to come face to face or even see the consequences of believing that drugs should be illegal. Um, and it, it's almost like you get to live in a fairy tale, believing that these laws are are doing something good and and. Uh, protecting people um, because you can be removed from those actions. And then I would also say along with that, um, there's the positive side of things too. Like like you mentioned healthcare, uh, or you could say like, well, I think it's good for money to go to cancer research or any number of good things. Um, it rather than taking on that responsibility yourself that this is important to me so i'm gonna either donate or or get involved or ma make sure that people have access to these things that are important or make sure this research happens or whatever is a good thing uh you diffuse that responsibility to the state and say um well yeah i'm not i'm not gonna make sure my neighbor has health care because the state should be doing that. And, and I'm going to vote for the state to do that. Um, and so it, it, it kind of, it takes the responsibility out of our hands to be contributing to the good in the world because we've, we've outsourced that kind of what we're supposed to be doing as the body of Christ to the state who, and then we cannot think about it and not, I guess, analyze if they're doing a good job at it, if they're efficient at it, if um, the money going towards that is really being used in the best way. Um, and and also, you're, you're able to 
make all of your neighbors contribute to things that you think are important, um, whether they want to or not, which is another big part of it. And I, I think a lot of that comes from people have a fear that good things wouldn't happen unless everyone was being forced to contribute to it. Um, but also, I think we tend to really kind of swallow this lie that, that we don't have any power in and of ourselves, that we have to belong to something bigger to get anything done. Um, and I think for Christians, it's like we totally deny the power of the Holy Spirit and, and think, well, we might not say it, but with our actions, say the state is more powerful than the Holy Spirit. I can't do God's calling on my heart. I have to outsource that to the state to make sure they take care of these issues that I think are important. Um, and I think we, we have that natural desire to be part of something bigger and it, and it's misplaced when we put that in the state. Yeah. I think, I think outsourcing is a, a really good word. Um, and, and the example that, that I use frequently, um, of, of when I kind of realized this was, I think it was the 2016 election and I was, I was sitting in church and, um, you know, I was really contemplating not voting and I talked to some people about that. And most people are like, you have to, it's your responsibility. You have to vote. And I was sitting in church one day and they were announcing like, Hey, we really need helpers for the food pantry. We don't get enough helpers. And I was like, I don't have time for that. And I was like, oh, they never get anybody for that. Nobody, nobody ever has time. We have busy schedules and all that stuff. And then I was like, wait a second. I'm here like debating over giving one 137 millionth of a vote for a candidate who may or may not win, who even if he does win, may or may not pass the legislation that I think is good. Um, and Or I can actually tangibly really go down and help somebody, help 50 people, 100 people, however many show up. Right. at a food pantry and so i was like it, it it was so it was such a wake-up call to me to realize that i i was giving up my tangible duty and practice and responsibility yet voting seemed like such a big deal and i only do that once every four years the food pantry i can meet people in my community and build relationships and do it on a daily or a weekly basis and um you know if christians would pool our our uh, power to actually physically, tangibly go help people every day, every week, once a month, um, that would be so much more powerful than than trying to gather our votes for a guy who may or may not win and may or may not do anything. Absolutely. It would completely change the world. And I, yeah, people don't give that credit that we're so wrapped up in politics and the amount of time and money and energy wasted. You just think of like, what if Christians all stopped watching Fox News and instead took that time to even just go check on your neighbor or, or just do something small? The world would be a completely different place and we would be so much further into creating God's kingdom on earth. It, it would be unbelievable. And w with podcasts like this and like the Bad Roman Project, I... That's my hope of what we're really encouraging people to do is like quit wasting your time on these kingdoms of the world and get busy building the kingdom of God because you have so much more power than they've lied to you that you don't have any power, that your only power is in voting and in participating in this political process, which is really just a soap opera. It's, it's very dramatic and none of it's real, but it keeps people engaged. Um, and, and continually robs them of the real power they have in the world. Yeah, so the power that the state wants to give you is the power to kill and, and do things that are, aren't good, and the power that they take from you is the power to do good. It's, it's this um, you know, weird inversion type thing. So let me ask you a question. This is, I've, I've talked my wife into pacifism. She's, she's there. I think we both are like, I don't know what I'd actually do if somebody's coming in and trying to harm my kids. Like, Real world yeah. might be a little bit different, but ideologically we're there. Um, I think I'm I'm like 95% anarchism at the moment. The, there's still days where I'm like, ah, this part just really doesn't make sense. And what about this? So here's one of the questions that, that she asked me that maybe you can answer. Um, she would say, 
I think something like, yeah, you're right. Um, we do abdicate our responsibility when, when we vote and don't help our community. But if I take an hour out of my day once every four years to go vote for the president, that doesn't mean that I necessarily give up my responsibility. There might be a tendency to do that for a lot of people if I idolize politics, but I'm not going to say that it's a problem to vote just because a lot of people idolize politics at this point in history. How would you respond to that? Yeah, so I could definitely see where she's coming from. Um, I think the, let me gather my thoughts. <laughs> um, I think, uh, so just from what we've seen, um, I don't think there are many people who vote and aren't invested in it or don't believe that they're really doing something. Um, I, I guess if you're a person who, who votes and somehow doesn't get wrapped up in that system, I, I'd say that's better. Um, but the, the, there's such a strong pull to, to get wrapped up in it and to really get have your hope and faith tied up in whether this person wins or, or believe that's what's going to change the world. Um, I just think for, for your own mental and spiritual well-being, it, it takes away from where your focus should be. Um, and maybe some people can avoid that trap. But the other side of it, I would say, is um, it legitimizes the system. At every vote that they get, it is propping up that system and and making it more important and more influential. Um, like like our our friend Chris Polk, who who does the Unbeliever podcast, he he's said in the past like he voted for governor in his state um, and said, yeah, I, I wasn't invested. I saw it kind of like is voting uh, on American Idol. Like <laughs> it's not going to change my life one way or another. Um, but then my response was, well, if nobody voted on American Idol, it wouldn't be a show anymore. You know, it, if people weren't invested, if people weren't participating, um, then it, it wouldn't matter. And it, I think that is our main tool of it. If we're talking about eliminating the state or even reducing the power of the state, I think the main way we do that is making it obsolete, making it so nobody cares about that. And I, so I think parti stopping participating in it is a major thing, stopping worrying about whatever they're doing. Um, and then the other side of it would be uh, us as Christians serving our communities so much that when they need help with something or see something uh, they wish they could change about their community, their first thought is not, there should be a law. Their first thought is, well, we should get the Christians aware of this because they're the ones who are always helping people and solving problems. Um, so that that's, I guess, what I would say to that. Yeah, I guess solving problems is better than causing them, which is probably what they say about us now. Right, um, <laughs> exactly. It would be great if we could yeah. change that reputation. <laughs> it uh, it kind of reminds me, I don't know if you've ever, if you've ever heard of, um, you know, there's a, a like famous uh, example of, you know, somebody says, when did you stop beating your wife? And the thing is, well, if you say, I didn't stop beating my wife, you know, because you never did, if you say, I didn't yeah. stop beating her, well, that's the wrong answer. And if you say, I did, then I did stop, that means you did at one point. And yeah. so it's kind of, uh, maybe that's what you you mean with the, the politics here and not playing the game, because they're asking us, hey, when did you stop beating your wife? Like, do you want the Republican answer or the Democrat answer? like right i don't want to i'm not i'm just not going to play i'm not going to answer that because um you know that's a it's a childish question or a illegitimate question yeah and a, and a trap kind yeah. of like <laughs> yeah yeah exactly it's a trap and and i think that's what that's exactly what you see with politics for sure um okay so a, another question here i think this is the last question in this section but um I think one of the allures to voting and government is that 
it's probably because of the news media and, and being able to see into Yemen, being able to see into China, being able to see into uh, the, the ghettos in my own state, we, we see problems as global, as, as huge. I mean, the problems are enormous. And um, I can't solve Flint, Michigan's water problem, but the government can. Um, and I can influence the government doing that through voting. And so because I can't do everything in the world, why, why shouldn't I diffuse some of my power, some of my responsibility to the government so that they can do something for Flint, Michigan, or for, you know, to, for Yemen or whatever else? Right. And yeah, I think that's what a lot of, I mean, I think everyone who's involved with the state or believes in its power comes at it from that angle of uh, there are problems in the world, they need to be solved, I'm too small to do this by myself, but the state has the power that they can do it, so let's get together and influence the state to do these good things. Um, So that that comes down to what what I call the the unicorn problem, that the the state is a unicorn and people are always arguing like, oh, well, the unicorn should do this or the unicorn should do that. And, and But what it comes down to is that the unicorn isn't real. It doesn't exist. If you look at reality, you know, the, the water problem in Flint, Michigan has been going on for years and nothing has ever solved that. Obviously, I, I don't think there's a single person that I could ask about it, who wouldn't say like, yeah, that should be top priority to get that fixed right away, yet it's still unsolved. Um, and it potentially could be solved if instead of people waited waiting for the state to do it, had been like, you know what, I'm a plumber or I'm willing to hire a plumber and let's just one by one start fixing some pipes and replacing them and um, not that they would have permission to do that. But that, again, it's it's an issue of where the state has caused the problem and the state is not willing to solve the problem. Um, and it, the same thing with Yemen, that, that the humanitarian crisis there is directly caused by the collusion between the U.S. and Saudi governments um, who are purposefully causing these children to starve and die of cholera. Um, so you can say I'm not big enough to solve that problem on my own, but you certainly wouldn't go to the entity that's causing it and believe that they would solve it either. I feel like don't waste your time there. Uh, maybe you are not big enough to solve the entire problem by yourself, but whatever good you can do by yourself is much, much more than the state is ever going to do about it. Um, and. With the Yemen thing, I think, oh my gosh, it's so important to encourage young people to never ever join the military. Um, uh, if that could be the, <laughs> the one legacy I could leave the world is that I helped young people know that it, it's not a good idea to join the military. Oh man, I could die happy because um, that that's so glorified in our culture uh, and and one of the things that is seen as helping people and being a protector and doing good for the world and and really you're participating in causing things like what's going on in Yemen right now and um oh my gosh if if again people could take responsibility for their actions and not be willing to participate in that kind of stuff um and if if we could just do the work to wake young people up to the reality of what the military actually does before they're in there and can't get out without going to jail. Um, that would be huge. Yeah, I, th- I think that's a great answer. I'm glad you said that, that um, yeah, a lot of the problems that, that are out there to fix are the result of the state. And uh, we have such a short memory. I talk a little bit about Iran and I only in the last like two years learned about why Iran hates us because our American memory starts in 1979 with hostages. It's like, well, what preceded that? What did we do to make them want to take hostages? Right. If even back that far, I mean, uh, people don't keep track 
whatsoever. It, it, it's just the line of like defending freedom, spreading democracy. We don't really pay attention to the details. We just know we're doing good things and we have to stop the terrorism. And um, yeah, pe people don't even remember back to 1979. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I, I've been reading about North Korea too, which I mean, don't get me wrong. They're a, they've got some really serious issues. They're, they're terrible in, mm -hmm. in regard to human rights, but um, you know, as, as reading, I think his name was Curtis LeMay. He was uh, responsible for bombing in world war two, but he also bombed in Korea. And he said, like proudly, he's like, yeah, we killed 20% of the, the Korean population. We bombed everything that moved. They bombed like 90% of Korea, the hydroelectric dams to flood, um, you know, villages and things. And you're just like, no wonder they hate us and they, they don't want, yeah, it's, we, we create our problems. So we'll stop there. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, uh, and, and I guess the last thing I'd put in this section, so you, you mentioned the Milgram experiment. Um, I mentioned ordinary men and they thought they were free as good resources for the first section for diffusing, diffusion of power down. For diffusion of power up, I think I would mention um, Kitty Genovese or Kitty, Gen Kitty Genovese uh, is a story that I heard when I was taking some psychology classes. And, you know, she, it's uh, I think it was from her her case study that um, this idea of the bystander effect comes up. And so Kitty was in like New York City, and she was being attacked, and like she was screaming. Well, there are thousands of people who could hear her screams, and um, nobody did anything and finally one guy yelled out his windows hey let that girl alone and then she laid there for 10 minutes nobody helped her and the attacker came back and raped her and killed her and people were like how how did this woman who thousands of people heard her screams um yeah. how did how was she attacked over a, a long period of time without anybody doing anything and um you know they they chalked it up to this this idea of the bystander effect and i think what you talk about in your articles, um, you know, and, and the unicorn idea and all that stuff, I think uh, there is this bystander effect where we kind of pass the buck. Somebody else will do it. Somebody else will take care of it. And um, yeah, so that's the second type of diffusion. Let's get to the the third um, type of diffusion, and this one is maybe um, you know maybe I'm taking the the idea of diffusion too far because it, it's using it in a different way, but it's it's the way that uh, power corrupts or diffuses through us and how it um, maybe makes us do things that we otherwise wouldn't do or, or mm -hmm. how it brings out who we really are, like the Milgram experiment. Um, I, I think Jesus showed us right that, that we're supposed to lead like servants. We're not supposed to lord over others like the Gentiles do. Could you explain why, why Jesus might have kind of said this um in regard to like what does what does power do to christians what does power do to people do you have any examples of of how power corrupts yeah so um i think you mentioned in the notes the the stanford prison experiment where um people were randomly sorted into groups of who who were the going to play out the part of the guards and who were going to play out the part of the prisoners and people who were friends with each other started treating each other horribly because they were given power over um, the people who were playing the prisoners uh, who, who they knew full well had, hadn't done anything to deserve to be in prison. It was just an experiment randomly assigned, but it, it really brought out horrible, horrible things in these people um, just because they were given power over someone else. Um, I don't think I fully understand why power so easily either corrupts people or, like you said, brings out the, I guess, darkest parts of our character. Um, but I think it, it's a pattern that's been seen throughout history and, and Jesus definitely warned against it. Um, when Jesus was being tempted in the desert, one of the things that Satan offered him was power over all the kingdoms of the world. Uh, and for some reason, I, I don't think that temptation stands out to people or they don't relate it to a temptation that we face currently. Um, but I think with, with democracy that it, it's really a temptation for everyone, 
where like back in monarchy governments, the, the normal people were like, yeah, I have no power and I'm never going to have any power in it. There wasn't so much of a temptation there, but with democracy, we, we all can gain power and we all could potentially run for office and, um, or have positions in the government. And so, uh, I think we, we really need to take that seriously that, that Jesus could have had power over all the kingdoms of the world. And, and you hear people too say things like, Oh, Jesus for president. And I wish Jesus could be in charge and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, well, he, he never would. Cause he knew that was, <laughs> that's not how the kingdom of God works. The kingdom of God works in the completely opposite way that you refuse to have any power over anybody else. And you just serve the people around you. Um, when you're serving the people around you, you're focused on what their needs are. Um, and you have to see them as full human beings and you have to get involved. And it's much, much more difficult. Whereas when you're in a position of power, you can think, well, I would like things to be like this, so I'll just make it so and assume that that makes everyone's lives better. Um, and and you, you don't see the humanity in other people as much um, they're just kind of people who need to get in line with your vision. Uh, and, and I think that happens in lots of ways, not even just with the state, but that's one thing that we can see in the church, the modern church, um, where it can, a lot of times, I'm, there's certainly great churches out there who don't have this problem, but a lot of times it can become kind of a cult of personality around the pastor, uh, and he, he comes into a position of power. And we, we've seen this with a lot of the Southern Baptist Convention um, scandals coming out of, of people being abused and it being swept under the rug. And, um, or even uh, the ways that church leadership is set up and, and who is allowed to be in and who's allowed to be out. And I think church leadership should almost be an oxymoron because it, it, it we shouldn't have positions of power in the church there shouldn't be people who who are lording power over others like like jesus accused the pharisees of um we shouldn't be setting up those those systems um and and because it's associated with god it, it's so easy for abuse to happen in those cases uh because you believe that your pastor is closer to God than you are, or your priest or your minister or, or whatever the case may be. Um, and, and so, yeah, I think we, we really need to take seriously Jesus's example and his rejection of power to, to be able to bring about the kind of world that he commanded us to. Yeah. Yeah, and I think a lot of the the church leaders like Ravi Zacharias and and others probably be, in part because of the power that they had and they were able to hide things and people just believed them and they were able to control and um, yeah, I'm sure power had something to do with that. Yeah. Uh, bringing up Jesus, um, you know, the temptation in the desert. I know that that's a big one um, in, in in our community and like in the early church, like bringing that up and people, like you said, just don't tie it to to our temptations today. Um, and it, it's really interesting to me that, you know, the, the three temptations that Jesus faces in the desert, he ends up facing again, less metaphorically, like, um, you know, they did, yeah. the people did offer to crown him king and he, right. he refused it. And it's interesting that so many people in, in my community would be like, well, yeah, he refused it because he had to get to the cross, you know, or, yeah. well, he refused it because why would you want to lead a bunch of. Uh, Palestinian Jews against the Empire of Rome, it just wouldn't have worked. So it's almost like Jesus's morality was either, um, you know, either he had to just get to the cross, so um, it's pragmatic in that sense, or it wouldn't have worked, so it's pragmatic in that sense, as opposed to, no, this is who Jesus really is. And it says that Jesus bore his cross, we'll bear ours. Jesus was persecuted, we will be too. And, you know, it, it's just... Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Sorry, rabbit trail. Yeah, no, you're totally right. Yeah, people make a lot of excuses of what, what, like, oh, yeah, Jesus didn't do it, but we totally should. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, so uh, to close out this section, one one book that I would recommend, I'm sure there are a lot more, and maybe you have some, but I was reading, in, in the last couple of months, I read um, a book called I Got a Monster, and it was about like the Baltimore police force, and just like helped me to understand so much why uh, the the poor and minority communities have such a problem with policing. Because it, it's not just like, well, here's one bad cop. It, it's kind of like, you see how the system creates people who might not otherwise have, have done things um, yeah. illicitly, but how it kind of creates them and how they're able to to exploit it and how, how these individuals change over time. So I would I'd recommend that one as, as a great example of kind of how power diffuses through us. Do you have any that uh, kind of stand out to you, any stories or books? Um, I wouldn't say in that sense. I, I think it's something super important to be aware of and to just recognize that anyone is, is capable of abusing power. Um, but I would I kind of take it in a different direction of like, almost like a good diffusing of power <laughs> because I think um, we do have this natural draw to, to be part of something bigger than ourselves um, because we can't change the world by ourselves. And I think when that leads you to try and gather power, then it's a bad thing. Um, but we do have the example of being the body of Christ where we work together as a community and all have different functions. So you could say in a way, like, because it can feel like there's so many issues and there's no way, even if I devoted my time full time just to serving other people and these problems I see in the world, there's no way that I by myself could do it all. Um, and I think that's, that's why we're supposed to be the body, because each of us has specific gifts and talents and abilities that are different and unique from other people. And we also each have a calling on our heart. Um, so I think it's really important, like you can get caught up in like, well, there's, there's homeless people, there's, there's people who don't have health care, there's um, people who have mental health issues, there's people who are drug addicts, there are, you know, people in war zones, and you could go on and on and on about all the problems in the world. But I do believe that God has put a specific calling on each of our hearts that there's something that you see in the world that you're like, yeah, that's the thing that really pulls on my heart. And it may change over time. Um, but I think recognizing that you're not expected to do everything, you do have to take responsibility to fulfill your part in the body. Um, but you're not expected to be the entire body. You have been created to be a hand or an eye or a mouth. And if you um, follow that leading of the Holy Spirit and just lean into what you're called to do and what you're gifted to do, um, that then that's how you can change the world. And, and if everybody is focusing on their specific role in the body, uh, then it is a, I get kind of a diffusion of responsibility because you don't have to take on the responsibility for the whole world. Um, but you do have to take on responsibility for the specific part of the body that you are. And um, so I guess that's kind of a positive way to look at it, that it you're not um, abdicating all responsibility but you're, you're only taking responsibility for what you're called to do, because I think it can be paralyzing to sit and think about all the problems of the world and how you're too small to solve them all. And so like, well, I guess I'll just not do anything. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a good reminder for uh, for me, because I'm, I'm reformed, so we're big on the total depravity thing. So sometimes it can be like, you know, human nature, evil. Uh, so it's it's good to be balanced out um, in that. And, and I think... And what you said is is uh, really good. It reminds me of, you know, we love God because He first loved us, and that's almost that that diffusion, like random acts of kindness. You know, when we submit and we humble ourselves and we serve, um, that does have a way of of diffusing. Or a gentle answer turns away wrath. Right? The, these 
these small acts of kindness and goodness and love do have a way of um, permeating through through our hearts. So I think that's that's a good reminder. And, and also just making me think when you talk about the body, that it's like, oh yeah, in, in a way, me trying to say, how am I going to help people in Yemen? How am I going to help Flint and do all these things? Like, I'm trying to be God. I'm trying yeah. to control the world. Um, at, at the same time, I'm not going to the food pantry down the road because what good is that going to do? Um, right. Right. When we see the things that we can do as too small to be worthwhile, so nobody does anything, then we're like a completely paralyzed body because we're each seeing our role as the finger or the hair follicle or whatever as too insignificant. And so if nobody does anything, then we don't have a body at all. And so, yeah, I think don't see your role in the world as too small. You're there for a reason and, and do what you can. And if everybody lived into that, and like I said, if all the Christians stop being involved in politics and just embrace their role of whatever tiny small part of the body they're supposed to be it would completely change the world okay so this is a perfect segue into into kind of the last section because i think as a reformed individual and somebody who's mostly an anarchist those are two things that i associate with with a lot of pessimism um and maybe i'm wrong about the i don't know the anarchism community that well yet but um i think it would be good to answer uh, to end on a positive note and to talk about, okay, so we, we know what the state does and we can bash on the state all day, at least I could. But what, like, what is, what is the alternative? And I think you've already, you've already talked about the body. And I know Stanley Hauerwas talks about how the, how the church is the Christian's politic. Um, how do you see the church as kind of being a panacea for the things that we talked about today, you already mentioned that it actually is able to diffuse in a positive way, but how does it, how does it keep us from, how, do, how does it resolve all of the other types of diffusion that we're talking? How does it help us to take responsibility where we should? How does it prevent us from doing things we shouldn't? And how does it help us to remain pure in the sense of kind of when power does tempt us and try to diffuse through us? Christianity, the church as a body is able to help us kind of repel that. Yeah. So I'd say a, a lot of Christian culture right now in the modern American church um, does the opposite of those things. Uh, it really kind of excuses away um, all of those things, seeking after power and diffusing your responsibility and feeling like, um, being a Christian means you have the correct knowledge, um, I think is really, really emphasized in, in current Christian culture, uh, which really cer certainly knowing good things helps. Uh, but if, if that is all you're focused on, um, we're not bringing the kingdom of heaven to earth, which, which is the main thing that Jesus talked about in his ministry um, was it's all about the kingdom. Uh, the, the kingdom is here and we, and we just have to recognize it and embrace it and live into that. And, and that's what changes the world. Um, it's not about if you say the right prayer, you get a get out of hell free card. Um, <clears throat> so I, I mean, I have a lot of criticisms about <laughs> about that. But I think if if you truly are a follower of Christ and follow his examples um, of rejecting that political power of, of kind of being in the moment where you're at and, and seeing who is around you that you can serve um, and living into your giftings and your talents. Uh, I think Gosh, freedom is such a beautiful thing. And when you can see examples, like um, I really love Jeffrey Tucker and he has this quote that's, uh, I'm not gonna say it word for word, but um, that uh, an anarchy is beautiful and it, it's all around us. Um, you know, almost every single interaction you have is an anarchist interaction. Uh, only the things that the state interferes with are controlled by them. Um, so you can see like 
like people choosing to interact with each other, pe people choosing to do business with each other, um, people choosing to love each other and serve each other. And, and like you said, the random acts of kindness, all of that is the beautiful picture of freedom that is the kingdom of heaven. Um, and I think, I absolutely believe that God created us for freedom. And I think you can find that all over the Bible that uh, he, it's not about being controlled. It's about learning and growing and, and making our own choices and, ha and having the freedom to um, serve and, and quickly pivot. Like, like if you are really in relationship with somebody and um, you can serve them in a way that they need in the moment. And then if their needs change, you can change. Uh, and then, or if you make a mistake, you can recognize that and have to own up to it yourself with that specific person um, and change the way you interact with them. And then, but with the state, the policies and things are so entrenched. Everybody who's involved can recognize that they're terrible, but nobody can change it. Nobody can serve where they need to serve because everything is so encrusted in bureaucracy. And um, so I think recognizing the beauty of freedom, giving up our control over others, really taking seriously the criticisms that Jesus gave of the Pharisees of um, it's not about controlling people. It's not about giving them a list of rules that they need to follow before you can interact with them. It's about serving people right where they're at, accepting them for who they are. Um, and just, yeah, living into community. And I think that's the really beautiful picture of how the kingdom of heaven is supposed to work. And, and I think it's totally possible. Yeah, and I, I think the beautiful thing about the church as the body of Christ is that when I think about politics and I, I see, I'm sure it's always been this way, but once I became more politically aware, it just seemed like politic, politics pits people, one group against another group. And there's so yeah. much animosity. But and, and like you can't work with people when there's animosity. And I guess that's kind of built into our system where, you know, the checks and balances, it's basically one group trying to block the other group and um and such but the church is just such an interesting place because it doesn't feed that power struggle and it doesn't seek to create it shouldn't seek to create animosity but like you said our, our current church probably does um but it yeah it, it really well like paul said in christ there's no uh Jew or Gentile, no male or female, no slave or free. We're all one. We're united. So it takes away those um, kind of tribalistic conflicts where we can all be one together serving one purpose. And and I think, yeah, like you hit the nail on the head with um, politics. It's all about the tribalism and people get so entrenched in that and and wanting their side to win and it's like even if they don't agree with their side it's like they make themselves like i just want to have that group identity <laughs> yeah. and i yeah. i think that's a big thing that in, in christ not that we no longer have an identity but that it doesn't have to conflict or try to overpower someone else's identity yeah we can be who we are and accept the diversity because god created us all different and that's beautiful and how it should be yeah I, yeah i would say to summarize that we have a unified identity but i would also add to that that um you know so he says we're not <clears throat> jew or greek male or female um but he also says that no member of the body is unimportant so he, we also have yeah. have um the same importance and and that's something that I, I know we don't feel like we do, but that's that's really freeing as well. And it it makes me, if I'm the hair follicle, recognize that that that's important for me to to do that. And if I'm you know the brain, it it helps me to still value the hair follicle. Um, totally. And it it brings up this thing that in 2016, it just I realized like our community um, we want effectiveness as opposed to to faithfulness. 
And um, to be a faithful hair follicle is difficult because it feels pointless. Um, but, you know, it reminds me of, of Saul when he goes to make sacrifice and Samuel says, what are you doing? God said not to do that. And Saul says, well, I'm doing this great thing for God. And Samuel's like, uh, obedience is better than sacrifice. God doesn't want your sacrifices. He doesn't want your Republican Party or whatever party you're in. Like, to yeah. sacrifice morality to get that, that's not what God wants. God wants your faithfulness, even if even if it means you're a hair follicle. Totally. I love that. Um, that's kind of all that I was thinking. Do you have, do you have anything that you want to add or, um, I, you can plug your stuff then, but do you have anything that you want to add, um, in regard to what we've been talking about? I don't think so. I think that was really good. Okay. Well then go ahead and plug your stuff and, um, and I'll, I'll make sure to link whatever you, you mentioned in the show notes. Okay, um, so I'm a contributor on the Bad Roman Project. So you can find my articles there, and I'm on a lot of podcast episodes. Um, it's it's Craig's podcast, but uh, he, he kind of calls me his co-host sometimes because he has me on so often. But um, yeah, so check out our stuff over there. Well, thank you very much for, for joining us, and um, I had a lot of fun. Yeah, me too. Thanks for having me on. So I don't usually do uh, much of an outro on interviews, but I've I've been thinking a lot about my conversation with with Abby, and um, you know a lot of the things that that we talked about and some of the things that she said were were just really good to kind of hash out and and talk with somebody else instead of talking that out in my own mind, which is what I usually do. Um, so that was really good, and and some of these things have been really stirring around in my my head for a while. But one thing that I, I kind of latched on to this time around was um, where Abby brought up the great point that um, I, I think a lot of times it's easy for for people in, in my situation coming out of maybe conservative evangelicalism, or still in it, but kind of coming out of, out of the fishbowl and looking into it and being like, yeah, I, I still identify with a lot of the, the aspects of this group, but I, I can't identify with the culture. And it's easy for me to be really negative and, and condescending. Um, but I think Abby was right in, in her positive outlook and in terms of just you know being faithful and, and doing the right thing. And so I was thinking more about Stanley Harawas and what he talks about is the, the church being the politic for the Christian and really investing in the church. And um, when I thought about that, there's a, a poem that I wrote uh, maybe like 10 or 15 years ago uh, about this. I guess I was kind of having some similar frustrations um, uh, of uh, you know feeling like I was trying to do stuff for the kingdom and um, my culture was, was maybe um, – demeaning or or holding holding itself back holding me back and I was holding it back I felt pretty useless so I, I wrote this poem and and I think it um you know, it's really simple and it's it's not like anything um like magnificent but I think the idea here is 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 good and I think it pulls out some of the things that that we said and, and kind of identifying how we have these frustrations but yet how God in his magnificent wisdom decided not to just do everything himself and not to just give one or two people this this magnificent power to be able to go out and conquer the world for him, but how he really brings us into relationship with himself, but he also calls us into relationship with each other. For as flawed and messed up and as we are and for as many mistakes as we make, you know, we're all needed and... Um, that forgiveness of others as well as the repentance of ourselves because we're all messed up and we're all part of the body I think is really important. Yet, like we talk about on this podcast over and over and over again, our tendency is to try to be like Adam and Eve. You know, we want the power. We want the knowledge. We want to define good and evil for ourselves. We want to determine um, when we can be faithful and when we have to sacrifice faithfulness and obedience to get what we think God must want to accomplish the ends, right? We, we sacrifice his means. So I'll, I'll read this poem and um, just kind of leave it there. I have but one heart I can give. I have but one mind to attend. 
I have but one life I can live. I have but one soul to ascend. With these things I feel and think. I'm broken for a world in despair. And as it draws closer to the perilous brink, I wonder what I can really do here. It seems patronizing the way I was made, longing to do more than I can do. It seems almost hopeless to fight this evil displayed or bring out the good in a world so skewed. So why then did God give me two of these eyes that see all the suffering with only one heart to break? And why have two ears that hear endless cries, yet only one soul for whose decision I make? And why have two hands so willing to help men despair, but have one limited mind to control their action? And why have two feet willing to go anywhere, yet only one life to carry this passion? So why just one, not two, three, or more? Then I'd have the power to redeem this fallen place. But only you have that power, my omnipotent Lord, and you choose to use me in my fallen race. You want me to see that alone I will fail. You want me to depend on the power you give. And the body you gave me is not just this one limited shell. It's the hands and the feet of all you forgive. That's all for now. So peace, and because I'm a pacifist, when I say it, I mean it. This podcast is a part of the Kingdom Outpost Network. Please check out the links below to find other great podcasts and content related to nonviolence and kingdom living.